an expanse of open sea not far from the coast. The TARDIS materialises in mid-air, slowly descending over the waves, before setting down gently on the surface of the water. Moments later, the Doctor and his young companions, Jamie and Victoria, scramble out into a rubber dinghy and row towards the shore. The Doctor helps Victoria out of the dinghy onto the shingle beach. There! Hello, Victoria. Oh. Oh. Trust you to bring us right down the middle of the sea. The TARDIS is perfectly oh. capable of taking you, know? Oh, England, undoubtedly. Ah, you can tell by the weather and the white cliffs. You always seem to land on this planet. No, ah, it's always England. I think by the hammering the TARDIS has got you gone and spiked it. Where are you going? Something further along the beach has caught the Doctor's attention. Jamie and Victoria follow him. Hey, look, what's all this stuff, Doctor? Oh, you silly. You often get it on the seashore. I'm ah, not in big lumps like this, eh, Doctor? Oh. No, not usually, Jamie. The doctor scoops up a handful of foam. Hey, Jamie, spill that. He playfully shoves the foam into his companion's <laughs> face. <laughs> right. <laughs> right. <laughs> Seconds later, all three are engaged in a high-spirited battle with foam flying in all directions as they run up and down the sand. Catching sight of something ahead, Jamie stops and points down the beach. Oh, I hardly think so, Jamie. Well, let's go and see. Shaking off the foam, the three travellers make their way along the shore. At last, they reach a vast steel pipe which curves up out of the sand and into the face of the cliff. What is it? Well, it's what it says, Jamie. It's Euro Sea Gas. Uh, gas from the sea? Uh, who are you trying to kid? So it's nothing to do with the foam, then? No, no, I shouldn't think so. That is. The doctor peers closely at a large black metal box that is fixed securely to the pipe. Tracing his fingers around its edges, he tries to find a way to open the box. Will it not budge? No, it won't touch it, I'm afraid, Jamie. Oh, well, I have to use this. What's that? It's a sonic screwdriver never fails. He activates the wand-like device and, seemingly of their own accord, the screw securing the lid of the box rotate cleanly out of their threads. There we are. Neat, isn't it? Hmm? All done by sound waves. Now, what have we got here? Oh, yes. What is it? What's that noise? I don't know, Jamie. The doctor replaces the lid, then, rummaging in his pockets, he pulls out a stethoscope and listens intently to the pipe. His brow furrows at the sound of a distant, faint, pumping heartbeat. Jamie and Victoria crowd closer to the doctor. I can hear it too. Yes. It's probably only throbbing from a pump, you know. Doctor, please hurry up. I don't like this place. It so quiet. I feel as if we're being watched. All right, Victoria. Now then, Jamie. The doctor and his companions are being watched. A small monitor screen displays an image relayed from the telescopic sight of a high-powered, remote-controlled rifle positioned high on the cliff. The image moves, and the crosshair target settles on the doctor. A shot catches the doctor in the shoulder and he crumples to the sand. <laughs> Victoria and Jamie rush to the doctor's side. The weapon recites and then fires twice in quick succession.
finds herself lying on the floor of a brightly lit room, with two armed guards standing over her. When she tries to sit up, she finds her limbs heavy and unresponsive. A low groan at her side tells us she is not alone. Doctor! Uh, uh, Doctor! Uh, 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 Victoria? Uh, Jamie, you there? Oh, I think so. Uh, I can't move. My legs. What happened? What do you want? Would someone kindly tell us where we are, please? Why don't you answer? Come on, where are we? What have they done? I can't move. I think we've been we've been tranquilized, Victoria. Eh? Hey? Tranquilized. Who do they think they are? Hey, we used to be asking the questions. I shall expect quite a lot of answers. But what is this place? You mean you don't know? Oh, if I could only just get up. I shouldn't try if I were you. You know, in this position, it's just, just a little difficult to communicate. Shall we give them some U for, sir? Eh? Hey. Yes, do that. What's that? What's U for? Oh, I no. think it's all right. I think it's the antidote. Anyway, there's nothing right. we can do about it, you know. Oh. Oh, yeah. oh. Yes, that's better. Thank you. Oh, thank you very much. Yes. Oh. Oh. You were on the beach by the pipeline in a restricted area. Now, why? We were lost, that's all. You were tampering with the emergency release valve remote control. You're a saboteur. He's not. He's a doctor. I can assure you, I was only being curious. I don't really see how they could have had anything to well, do with it. Well, I want your opinion, Harris. I'll ask for it. Meantime, lock them up in one of the cabins. I'll interrogate them later. And you lot, get back some work. Is he always as charming as that? We've something of an emergency on at the moment. You see, we've just lost contact with one of our rigs at sea. Do you mean communications have broken down? No, that's what's curious about it. As far as we can tell, our video link is functioning normally. The crew just aren't answering. You can't blame us for that, surely. There's also been a drop in pressure in the feed lines from the rigs. Uh, you were seen tampering with a release valve on the pipeline. I told you I was really being curious. Were you? Are you calling us liars? No, but... You must admit your sudden appearance here inside our restricted area is suspicious. That's no reason to shoot us down like animals. Maybe not, but we were under a security alert, and Mr. Robson's, well, under considerable pressure himself. Uh, I'm sorry, but I shall have to do as he says and lock you up. Oh dear. Uh, would you uh, follow me? Have a long Why does it it? Harris leads the way. Encouraged by two armed guards, the travellers follow him. Elsewhere, Harris's wife, Maggie, finds her route barred when she tries to leave the refinery compound. May I see your pass, please, madam? Pass? I have instructions that no one is to leave or enter the compound without a written pass from Chief Robson. Not until after the emergency. But you know who I am. My husband is second in command to Chief Robson. Yes, Mrs. Harris, I... Then let me pass. Please. Sorry, madam. I think you should return to the residential block. I'm sorry, but there's nothing I can do to help you until you tell us what you were doing with that release valve on the pipeline. It wasn't the valve I was interested in. Oh, I heard a movement coming from inside the pipes. A movement? Uh, oh, it's all right, you can go. Yes, movement. Uh, don't ask me what it was. Well, I'm not quite sure what you're trying to suggest, but I can assure you marine life couldn't possibly get inside the pipeline tube. It would never get past the drilling pumps. Yeah, that's a maybe. But there was something inside that tube because I had it too. And so did I. But if the pressure is down in the pipes, perhaps that's the reason why. Perhaps marine life has got into the pipes. Oh, it's impossible. We spent years of time, money and research into perfecting our emergency systems. Or perhaps there's a fracture in the pipes, a, a break, and uh, something's got in that way. Oh, I doubt it. Uh, Mr. Harris, I don't wish to uh, uh, appear interfering, but don't you think it would be a good idea to turn off the gas, at least until you've had a chance to check? Oh, Chief Robson would never agree to that. Why not? Well, he doesn't believe in working to the book. He prides himself that the flow has never been shut off ever since he took charge. Oh, he sounds a very silly man. Mm, but he appears to be right about one thing. Uh, you seem to know quite a lot about our business. In the control hall, technician Price summons Robson to the communication station. Chief, yes. we've regained contact with Rig D. Come in, Rig D. Come in, please. 
Big D, can you hear me, please? Yes, D.H. too. I can hear you. Tony, what the oh, dickens is going on out there? Everything's quite all right, Mr. Watson. What? You have the situation under control. Will you speak up, man? I can't hear a word you're saying. Don't worry. We're losing volume. Yes, I don't understand it. Uh, will you speak a little louder, Mr. Tony? Everything is under control. Tony! What happened to the emergency crew we sent you? Have they arrived yet? Yes. Yes, but they must stay here for the time. Do what? We've had a slight accident. Two men out of action. Now listen, Tony, you get that rig fixed, A1, and quick. But it will take some time. What? What did you say? What's wrong with this thing? I don't know, sir. It must be there, and He seems to be whispering. Everything's under control. Tony, speak up, man. Everything's under control. Tony! Everything's under control. Tony! I think we've lost contact again, Rob. Well, fix it, man. Stupid. Robson turns away in disgust as Harris enters. Right, he's getting too old for his job. Mr. Robson, I think we should turn off the gas flow coming in from the rigs and make a check. You think what, Mr. Harris? Well, that doctor chap, the stranger, he said he heard a movement coming from inside the pipeline on the beach. Oh, did he now? Did he say what he thought it was? Mice? Chief, she's down a further three. Pressure's just on 157. 157? Are you sure? Yes, sir. That means the gas flow pressure is down at the rate of 3% every... 20 minutes. Doesn't this prove that something must be blocking the pipeline? It proves nothing of the sort. It's probably a faulty gauge, that's all. Check it. Look, at least give us the benefit of the doubt. When you want to find out about pipelines and rigs, Mr. Harris, the thing to do is to go out to sea and work on them. Look, I'm merely saying that if something has got into the tube, then we you should... You let me worry about that. But, Mr. Robson, please listen. Look, this ties up with what I've been trying to tell you. For three weeks now, there's been a regular and increasing build-up and fall in pressure. Look, I think you should at least look at my calculations. In the bunk room, Jamie is standing on the doctor's shoulders. I've got it. Uh, he passes down a grill he has removed from an opening above the door. Can you see anyone? All clear. You think you can make it? Of course I can make it. Hold on. Don't bother, Jamie. And do it with this. Pick a lot with a hairpin. Don't be daft. Suddenly, Jamie slips. Ah! Clumsy! Victoria continues to work on the lock ah. as Jamie sticks his head out into the corridor. Maggie, where have you been? I've been trying to contact you. I was on my way to the village, but Robson's camped down on security. I'm just coming to find you to get a pass. Yes, there's been a bit of a flap on that. Well, can I have a pass? Not at the moment. Look, could you do something for me? Yes, what is it? There's a file. It's probably in the middle drawer of my desk in the study. Could you get it and bring it to me at the control room? All right, darling. What's the panic? Look, I'll explain later. Don't be long. All right, darling. Bemused, Maggie watches her husband leave, then heads back to their living quarters. Unaware that Jamie has narrowly escaped being spotted, Victoria assumes the worst. Dark. No, he's not. Are you ready, Jamie? Yeah. Right. The doctor gives Jamie a huge shove, and he tumbles headfirst into the corridor outside. Momentarily stunned, Jamie staggers to his feet. Behind him, the door swings open. Told you not to bother. Oh, sorry about that, Jamie. Jamie glares after the doctor and Victoria, then follows. Maggie Harris returns to her apartment in the married quarters. Going through to the study, she searches for her husband's missing file. Eventually she finds it, though not in the drawer her husband had indicated. Picking it up, she is puzzled to see that something is tucked inside. Maggie flips open the file then drops it with a start as she's suddenly stunned. 